I think Australia is in real trouble. We're heading down the wrong path. If we don't make some big changes now, it'll be too late. The quality of life that we've grown up with will soon be a distant memory. And we'll look back and wish that we had have done something when we still had the chance. My name is Matthew Bryan and I'm going to be running as an independent in the upcoming election for the seat of Hughes. So if you live in this part of Sydney, I want your vote. Keep watching to see how the major parties are ruining Australia and what I propose to do about it if elected. We have seen a sharp decline in our living standards in the past five to ten years. Unaffordable housing, overdevelopment, locals missing out on jobs to foreigners, increasing traffic congestion and pollution, rising homelessness and overcrowded schools, hospitals and public transport are ruining life in Sydney and Melbourne and our other cities will soon be the same. The root cause of these problems is our rapid population growth, driven by the highest immigration rate in the developed world. We live in the driest inhabited continent on Earth, essentially a thin strip of fertile land on the edge of a giant desert. We haven't got much water, droughts are common, soils are poor, and only 6% of the land is arable. Our carrying capacity is therefore very limited, yet governments keep dumping a city worth of people on us every year. After decades of high immigration following World War II, we had finally come to our senses in the 90s, reducing the intake to something more sustainable. In the few years before John Howard became Prime Minister, the intake was averaging around 70,000 per year. He maintained these sort of numbers until around 2001, but then things soon started to get out of hand. After the 9-11 attacks, Australia had a sense of paranoia regarding Muslims. A month after the attacks, we had the children overboard scandal, where Howard lied about Muslim asylum seekers throwing children into the water. He used this as an opportunity to make it sound like he was against high immigration. We will decide who comes to this country and the circumstances in which they come. But in fact, he was doing the opposite. Shutting the door to the relatively small number of asylum seekers arriving by boat, all the while stealthily shoving open the doors to economic migrants arriving here by plane. He never explicitly mentioned that he was a high immigration man because he knew the electorate would be against it. Instead, he scapegoated refugees to give the impression that he was stemming the migrant inflow, all the while proceeding in secret with his big Australia plan. By the time Howard left office, immigration had more than doubled from when he started, and our successive governments increased it even more, to the extent that from 2013 to 18, the cap was set at an absurd 190,000, almost triple from 1996. Just look at these figures. In just eight years, we have given permanent residency to nearly 1.5 million people. That's more than the population of Adelaide. That's like allowing two MCGs worth of people, or 20 suburbs worth of people, the right to live in Australia permanently every year. And remember, these figures are not even including our refugee intake. It's just the number of people being granted permanent residency under the regular immigration program. If that's not bad enough, we also have a bogus temporary visa program, which includes many visa categories which are uncapped and easy for people to renew and stay here for many years. This is the case with our farcical student visa category. There were nearly 600,000 in September 2018. Their numbers are increasing rapidly and they have the right to compete with locals for jobs. We also have nearly 700,000 New Zealanders here a country whose citizens get special treatment above other nationalities, given automatic rights to live and work here as long as they like. Huge numbers of people are also migrating to New Zealand because it gives living rights in Australia. So we almost have open borders. All up, we had 1.68 million people here on these pseudo temporary visas in March 2012. We now have over 2.3 million, the equivalent of Brisbane, and the numbers are continuing to increase. So with all this going on, it's no surprise that we are now suffering the ramifications from governments flooding us with all these people. Young locals have been priced out of the neighbourhoods they grew up in by wealthy foreign buyers, mostly from China, who can afford to pay more than us. And it's not just new permanent residents who are allowed to buy real estate. Our government allows foreigners on temporary visas, including student visas, to buy any type of property, new or existing. 
This is where the demand is coming from. This is why developers are knocking down houses in our suburbs and building high-rise units. It's not to cater to us. We don't even want this. It's to cater to foreign buyers who are willing to pay 800 grand for a poor quality apartment. For Chinese used to living in such horrible conditions back home, they are more than happy to fork out the cash to buy their kids a place and then wait for them to be granted permanent residency in the hope that they can eventually get sponsored to move out here too. Most of our young people have given up hope of affording a home and resigned themselves to being renters. Yet if they choose to rent, they are usually being ripped off as student visa holders and other recent arrivals cram into overcrowded accommodation throughout our suburbs, allowing landlords to overcharge. I've known so many temporary visa holders over the years, and you should see the way they live. Four bunk beds in rooms designed for one person, living rooms separated by shade cloths, eight to 10 people squeezing into two bedroom apartments with each person paying close to $200 a week. It's madness, they live like animals. They are willing to live like this, but of course that's not how we want to live. So the end result is overcrowded high-rise neighbourhoods for foreign buyers who rent to foreign tenants, with young locals being no better off, no closer to owning a home, and being marginalised in the cities they grew up in, either forced to pay exorbitant rents and never get ahead, or move to the outskirts and spend hours commuting to work every day. Now you may be thinking that all these new arrivals being granted permanent residency are at least here because they have skills we desperately need, or that all these foreign students are a godsend that we need to fund our universities. Neither can be further from the truth. The truth is, our skills-based migration program for permanent residency is an absolute farce. For example, the employer-nominated scheme, the most popular visa category where companies employ migrants, does not require employers to conduct any type of labour market testing, meaning they are not even required to advertise positions or conduct interviews to see if they can find local applicants first. So our own people are not prioritised, essentially competing with anyone in the world for jobs in our country, even if they are suitably qualified or willing to undertake the necessary training. If you think that sounds unfair, we have a visa category called the Skilled Independent Visa, where people are granted permanent residency based on skills or qualifications they have. They don't even need a job offer to get this visa. We are granting these people permanent residency even though many don't have any interviews lined up in their field. They simply start competing for unskilled work that locals desperately need, which is crazy. Skills-based visas also allow permanent residency to dependents, meaning each year, thousands of wives, husbands and children are being given lifelong living rights, even when they have no skills we actually need. Skills-based visas are based on lists of eligible occupations that we supposedly need. Yet when you go through the lists, you can see there are literally hundreds of occupations. So people can find a way to immigrate for almost any type of skill you can think of, essentially saying that Australia desperately needs all types of workers, which is ridiculous. There are many occupations on the list that shouldn't be there. For example, various trades related to real estate construction, such as carpenters, electricians and plumbers are on the list. But who says we need more building? We wouldn't need more tradesmen if the government wasn't flooding us with all these people. Nurses and various types of engineers and IT positions are also on the lists. But we already have plenty of local graduates in these areas who are struggling to find work as it is. So clearly the concept of skill shortages is not based on what's truly best for Australia, but rather what particular industries want. Easy access to a desperate, compliant foreign workforce who will accept lower wages and conditions instead of spending the time and money on training local people and giving them a chance. We are often told that we need to sponsor more migrants to fill skills shortages in regional areas, but most of them just move to the cities once their permanent residency has been granted. So bringing in foreigners to work in the regions is never a long-term solution. If all this doesn't sound bad enough, regular Australians struggling to find work are also missing out on jobs to student visa holders. Stupidly, the government allows them to work 20 hours a week during session time and then unlimited in holiday breaks. But nobody follows this rule because it's never enforced. So what we have now is hundreds of thousands of people from third world countries that enrol in cheap, easy courses at private colleges with low contact hours and spend the rest of their time working 50 to 60 hours a week 
taking advantage of the better wages than what they can earn back home. At both unis and private colleges, cheating is rampant amongst foreign students. Prerequisites for enrolment, such as competent English skills, are usually ignored, and standards are slipping as unis and training providers are reluctant to fail foreign students because they want the money to keep coming in. Most student visa holders are not even here to study. They have ulterior motives to work, apply for permanent residency and stay. So the entire student visa system is a sham, nothing more than a corrupt de facto immigration program for cheap labour. The government conveniently includes international education in its export figures so our terms of trade don't look so bad. But how can you call something an export that relies on people physically living here and competing for jobs and real estate, many who cover the cost of their education from money earned domestically in Australia? There are so many other obvious ramifications from mass immigration. Our roads are clogged, so it's taking longer than ever to get around. And when you eventually get to your destination, you can't get a park. And it's not much better if you decide to use public transport, because with all these extra people, you can't get a seat on the train or bus. Our public hospitals are in disarray. It takes hours to see a doctor when showing up at the emergency department, and when we require surgery, we are having to wait longer because waiting lists are blowing out as they struggle to keep up with the added demand. Many public schools throughout Sydney and Melbourne are running well over their enrolment capacities, with overcrowding so bad that demountable classrooms are taking up most of the playground space. In fact, the new trend is building high-rise schools, where kids are stuck in a high-rise building. Immigrant parents from Asia might see nothing wrong with this, but it's not what Australians want for their kids. Our education standards are also falling, which is no surprise given the huge amount of immigrant parents that don't speak English to their children. It puts their kids at a massive disadvantage when they start kindergarten because they can't understand the teacher. We now have many schools where almost all children are from non-English speaking backgrounds, so we are having to spend huge amounts of money teaching them how to speak our language at the age when they should already be learning how to read. Our once tranquil suburbs with trees, houses and backyards are becoming unrecognisable as developers demolish them and replace them with ugly high-rise apartments which are sold to wealthy Chinese. This process often involves kicking out tenants with families. And it's not just houses. We are constantly seeing small business owners renting shop fronts, getting booted out by developers, jeopardising their livelihoods. Despite all this extra real estate being built, homelessness is skyrocketing because locals can't afford the rising rents, particularly when they lose their job or fall on hard times. And they can't get into public housing because waiting lists keep increasing. All this overdevelopment involves widespread bulldozing of trees, which are crucial for maintaining urban air quality. This combined with all the extra cars and trucks on the road means our suburban neighbourhoods are now tarnished with disgusting air pollution and excessive noise. And with all the extra sewerage that comes with a higher population, our rivers and beaches are gradually becoming more polluted. Surging demand for electricity has led to drastic price increases in the last few years, meaning many businesses are struggling to stay profitable and households have less disposable income. Surging demand for water is leaving us more vulnerable in times of drought. We will soon be reliant on expensive desalination plants just to access drinking water, as we simply don't have enough natural fresh water supply to support the growing population. It's also putting our food security at risk, as we are increasingly relying on imported food with dubious hygiene standards and which is less fresh by the time it reaches the shelves. Again, this is because we haven't got enough water and arable land to grow enough fruit and vegetables for this many people. But it's also because governments are allowing foreigners, especially Chinese, to buy up our farmland at a rapid rate. Food prices will continue to rise as foreign countries realise we are dependent on imports. Our export revenue also has to be diluted amongst more and more people, effectively meaning there is less wealth per person. Our quality of life is being destroyed by mass immigration. It affects almost every facet of our lives. People are angry and politicians realise this. Yet both major parties deliberately make sure that it never becomes an election issue because they both want to keep it going. They are catering to the demands of corporations who want to increase their profits by having a growing consumer base and an ever-present surplus of available labour relative to jobs available 
in order to put downward pressure on wages. They also want to save money on training by having easy access to a compliant foreign workforce who will accept lower wages and conditions. You'll never hear Frank Lowy, Harry Trigoboff or Jerry Harvey calling for less people because that would mean less people going to Westfield, buying units and buying household appliances. Our media want more people flooding in too because it allows TV stations to charge more for advertising space and both Fairfax and News Corp rely heavily on revenue earned from their respective domain and realestate.com.au subsidiaries. The major parties are afraid of the scare campaigns that corporate Australia and mass media will come up with if they don't get their way. High immigration also helps governments manipulate the public by boasting about simplistic economic statistics which do not tell the full story. GDP growth or the number of jobs created means nothing when the population is skyrocketing. In reality, wealth per person is falling and many new jobs are just going to migrants. We have some of the lowest income taxes in the world and Australians' reluctance to pay higher taxes is also partly to blame for ongoing mass immigration. It allows governments to get away with claiming we need to bring in more taxpayers to support the ageing population. Which of course makes no sense because migrants age too, so this strategy relies on never-ending mass immigration as well as never-ending increases in government expenditure on things like healthcare, education, public transport and pensions. In the past 30 years, the populations of prosperous countries like Norway, Germany, Finland and Netherlands have barely increased at all. They have ageing populations like us, but their high earners pay more tax, so they can properly fund their government services themselves. If we were smart, we would try to be more like them, sacrificing a little bit of personal wealth so we can preserve our quality of life by maintaining a stable population. But sadly, greed and insistence of low taxes continues to plague us. Our greed is also evident in our obsession with property investment as a means to build wealth. It's a classic pyramid scheme where reliable gains can only be made by constantly drawing more people into the system. But instead of considering the ramifications to our quality of life, people just think about the money. So governments maintain mass immigration because they don't want property prices to drop. There is also significant pressure from ethnic constituents, with certain electorates now dominated by Chinese and Indians who want lax immigration laws to allow their families to move here. Losing one or two seats can mean the difference between winning or losing an election, so politicians give them what they want. The lack of protectionism caused by embracing disastrous free trade agreements has destroyed manufacturing in this country, so the government stupidly encourages our non-academically inclined school leavers to take up trades, mostly in real estate construction, which of course relies on an ever-increasing population in order to maintain demand. And finally, we need to realise that the greatest threat to state power is nationalism. When a society's dominant culture gradually becomes diluted by multicultural immigration, it becomes easier for political and corporate elites to control us. This is because language barriers, suppression of free speech via political correctness, neighbourhoods becoming insular ethnic cliques and different perceptions of acceptable standards of living all mean that our population is far less united, less likely to organise protests, less informed and less likely to speak their mind. The multicultural agenda in Australia has nothing to do with altruism. It's just a form of the age-old divide and rule tactics, a deliberate ploy to dilute opposition to policies that serve the top 1% instead of the rest of us. Politicians prefer a compliant, uninformed electorate who won't criticise or protest and who are accustomed to third world living standards. They don't want the majority to be Australians with a long family history here who are noticing just how much our living standards have slipped. This is why they love letting in large numbers of third world migrants, people who are just grateful to have left places like China, India and Southeast Asia. I'm now going to summarise my policies. You can view them in full on my website, votematbryan.com. For starters, we need to slash immigration to 40,000 a year, 15,000 places for highly skilled people with no dependents, 10,000 places for spouses of Australians, and 15,000 places for refugees. The skill stream should only be for highly skilled occupations that we desperately need, and there must be extensive labour market testing before foreigners can be hired. 
companies must conduct labour market testing and offer training programs to local people before being allowed to hire foreigners on temporary visas. And even if they do, it should only be a temporary measure, with the aim of replacing them with local staff if and when they become available. We need to end the trans-Tasman travel arrangement with New Zealand. They shouldn't get special treatment. We need to eliminate all temporary visas unless the foreigner is studying or working. No more parent visas, partner visas, graduate visas, significant investor visas, and all the other visas that we hand out to people for stupid reasons. We need to cap the number of student visas issued each year to a maximum of 50,000, and student visa holders should not be allowed to work here. Foreigners should be banned from buying any type of real estate. Only Australian citizens or permanent residents should be eligible. We need to abolish negative gearing, first home buyer grants, interest only home loans and the 50% capital gains discount and banks should require a minimum of 30% deposits for home loans. Developers or any commercial entity should be banned from purchasing houses and we need an immediate freeze on increasing residential density Australia wide. We need to set up a rental waiting list where Australians are prioritised over foreigners. We also need to limit the number of tenants in all rental properties and all non-refugee immigrants should be ineligible for public housing. Lower immigration will obviously reduce the demand for building. For any companies which need to downsize, it must be foreign workers that are the first to go. We need to reduce the corporate tax rate to 20% for domestic tourism and entertainment companies, 15% for local manufacturing companies, and 0% for electric vehicle production to create more jobs for our working class that don't rely on mass immigration like construction. We should not sign any more free trade agreements and we need to renegotiate the existing ones to remove the provisions for migrant workers. We need to include compulsory courses in business, entrepreneurship and stock market investing in high school curriculums Foreign students should be prevented from enrolling in public schools when the enrolment capacity has been reached. We need to introduce minimum literacy and numeracy standards in high schools in order for students to receive a graduation certificate. And we also need stricter entry standards for universities. There should be no more privatising of public hospitals and immigrants should not be eligible for a Medicare card until they have been a permanent resident for at least five years. We should reduce the funding GPs get per standard appointment by $7.60, with the savings being redirected towards dental and specialist appointment costs. And we need to redesign Medicare cards with photo ID to prevent ineligible people from rotting the system. All non-refugee immigrants need to be ineligible for new start or rent assistance payments. We need to increase the waiting period from 10 to 15 years for immigrants that want to receive the aged pension. And we need to replace new start payments with a voucher system to prevent the cash being spent on non-essential items like alcohol, cigarettes, drugs and junk food. We need higher payroll tax for foreign employees. We need to increase staff numbers at the ATO for tracking tax avoidance. There needs to be harsher penalties for tax avoidance and employers paying staff below the minimum wage. All Australians should be legally entitled to work tax-free on farms. We need to introduce a help debt equivalence tax, where foreign workers are required to pay the same income tax rates that Australians who are paying off help debts are subjected to. And we need to introduce a new income tax bracket, 48% income tax for annual earnings above $300,000. Compulsory voting needs to be abolished, Immigrants who move to Australia as adults should never be allowed to vote in elections or hold political office. Political donations should be capped at $50,000 per year per party or independent and only $500 per donor. We need to ban all political donations from non-citizens and majority foreign-owned companies. And there needs to be tighter restrictions on what roles politicians can take up after their time in office. Our entire economic model is what's slowly destroying us because it's based on constantly flooding a dry, inhospitable continent with more people, with locals not prioritised for jobs, 
real estate and access to government services and with no consideration given to the adverse effects on our quality of life. It's unsustainable, immoral, and it shouldn't be allowed to continue. Future generations, your kids, your grandkids, are the ones who will suffer the most from the Australia we are creating. Our goal should be to increase our quality of life whilst maintaining a stable population where we prioritise our own people before anyone else and where greed does not dictate government policy. It's happening in other countries and we can do it too. This is what I'll be fighting for. If you think this makes more sense than aimlessly marching on the path towards a big Australia, then vote for me, Matthew Bryan, on May 18. Thanks for watching.